commercial fish, none is more thrilling to catch than these flashing creatures who live in remote Pacific waters. Men sail from ports all over the world to harvest the sea's rich and baleful fish, but seldom experience the exciting action of these fishermen who sail with the tuna fish. It takes teamwork and brawn to land these glistening fish of the tropical sea. The men who worked on the fishing racks of a tuna clipper will lift over the deck more than 300 tons of tuna before the end of their voyage. The landlocked harbor of San Diego is one of the key operation centers of the West Coast Fishing Fleet, one of the largest in the world. Into this beautiful harbor sail the tuna clippers of the West Sea California Tuna Packing Company's fleet, bringing their valuable catches of tuna from the fishing banks off the coasts of Central America and the Galapagos Islands. They berth at the docks of Westgate on the shores of the inner bay and consider the huge cannery their home base. Here at the plant, we meet the men and women who keep millions of cans of America's most delicious seafood flowing to our markets and homes. More than 7,000 of San Diego citizens are engaged in this multi-million dollar industry. These workers live and work according to American standards and traditions. They trade in local shops, own their homes and cars, and pay American taxes. that exists at the plant is reflected in the friendly attitude shown by these men and women. Careful thought is given to the safety, health, and welfare of the employees. As a result, the same personal pride that the captain and crew have in their tuna clipper extends to the plant workers who operate the machine, pack the tuna, and distribute the payroll. A clipper of the Westgate fleet is preparing for a ship that may last for three to four months and cruise more than 10,000 miles. The skipper and crew are hard at work provisioning the ship for its voyage. Enough food for months at sea must be put into the cooked larder and the storage refrigerator. If lucky, the ship may fill its hold with tuna in five or six weeks, but the voyage may stretch into months and supplies must be adequate. Salt is one of the essentials, for it is used in the freezing process. Fourteen tons are taken aboard to make the brine necessary for keeping the fish wholesome and fresh. The great diesel engines of 1,200 horsepower will need from 60 to 80,000 gallons of fuel oil. At normal cruising speeds, the clipper's engines will consume about 1,300 gallons every 24 hours. A supply of 30 new bamboo fishing poles is stored under the canopy of the base tank. Large tanks of ammonia are put aboard for the ice and brine refrigeration machines that will keep the 375 tons of tuna fresh during the voyage home from the warm waters of the tropics. This seaplane will search for the elusive schools of tuna when the clipper arrives at the fishing ground. with all goodbyes said, our ship heads south on the first leg of its voyage along the coast of Baja California and into the port of Guaymas in the Gulf of California. Here, as the ship lays at anchor, the crew gets ready for the important task of gathering bait. Thousands of ungainly pelicans crowd around the fishing boat in anticipation of the easy meals they'll enjoy when the crew sains for bait. The crew loads the net into skiffs 
which are towed by the ship's launch to the shallow waters where schools of bait are found. When a school is located, the net is put out to form a large circle or trap. The nets are 40 fathoms in length and extend to a depth of 12 fathoms. The men set the net by encircling the school and then begin the slow task of shortening the circle. As the heavy nets are pulled aboard the skiff, the shimmering antivettas become more tightly compressed and make the water a seething mass of wriggling fish. The pelicans, wise to this operation, glide in for a perfect landing and await the feast they know is in store for them. operation may be repeated for days until several thousand scoops of anchovettas or sardines have been obtained. Only bait collected in these southern waters will survive the voyage in the ship's bait tank through the warm tropical sea, for the water temperature averages 85 degrees. Bait gathering is not only strenuous work, but involves considerable expense. Special permits to fish in these foreign coastal waters must be obtained at a cost of several thousand dollars. After the trapped fish have been consolidated into a tight area between the two skips, they await the arrival of the bait receiver. The antivettas are then transferred to the receiver. When a full load has been obtained, the launch tows the receiver and skip to the side of the tuna clipper, where the live bait is transferred to the tanks of the ship. the pelican is always ready to grab a quick bite at this seagoing lunch counter. The crew now begins the steady task of dipping the scoops from the receiver and passing them up a human chain to the bait tank where the fish are released. The empty scoop is returned for another load of wriggling anchovettas and the process goes on and on until the last of the bait has been transferred aboard. Sharks and giant stingrays swim by and the pelicans get bolder and bolder. The bait tanks are protected from the hot sun by a wooden canopy. Thousands of gallons of fresh seawater are pumped through the tanks each hour to keep the bait alive and healthy. Later, when the tuna catch is complete, these tanks will be empty and refrigerated tuna will take the place of the bait. Brine, running through the pipes that line these walls, quickly converts the tank into a huge deep freeze. When the task of bait gathering is finished, the always hungry pelicans follow the clipper out of Guaymas Bay for a final farewell, and perhaps with the hope that a few more stray anchovettas will be tossed overboard. As the graceful ship sails southward to Central American fishing grounds, the crew is active with a variety of tasks. The skipper and navigator determine the ship's position and set her course. Jim, the radio man, keeps in constant communication with shore weather stations and with other ships for reports on fishing conditions. Ishimoto, one of the experienced fishermen, finds this a good time to do some work on repairing the bait net and is joined by other members of the crew. All tears must be mended, the net dried and stowed away for future use. Fishing sockets are designed to hold the butts of the fishing pole securely and protect the fishermen as the tuna is swung over the side of the ship. The sturdy 8 to 10 foot bamboo poles are trimmed and wrapped. All work comes to a sudden halt when the popular chef rings a bell to announce that cow is ready. Hard work and salt air develop hearty appetites and good food keeps the crew well and happy. Although tuna fishermen occasionally use live bait, most tuna are caught on a white feathered handmade jig called a squid. Fastened to a barbless hook is a carefully formed tuft of white feathers, which are wrapped tight at one end and covered with a special type of fish skin. Stout twine is then wrapped around the skin to form the body. At the end of the line, a swivel is tied, and a four foot length of piano wire is then added. The squid is attached to the end of the wire leader. From 
the bow of the clipper, we see schools of porpoise racing ahead of the ship. The vast blue ocean provides a perfect playground for these lively mammals. To the fishermen, this is a favorable sign, because porpoise nearly always indicates the presence of tuna. To keep watch for the threshing water and circling seabirds that indicate a school of tuna, the captain sends a lookout aloft. The great leaps of the porpoise resemble the actions of a hooked marlin or sailfish. A man of war bird keeps his private watch over what is going on. Two members, aided by powerful binoculars and a rangefinder, also keep a vigilant lookout for schools of tuna. Next morning, the skies are overcast, and the ship rolls in the heavy swells of a sudden tropical storm. But a school of tuna has been found, and fishing begins at once. Tuna fishing is always strenuous work. But the added handicap of a pounding sea and heavy swell makes the work doubly hard. To fish while standing chest deep in water on a rack hung over the side of a pitching vessel requires long experience. Tuna of this size takes the strength and teamwork of two men. Two lines are attached to a single swivel and piano wire at the end of which dances the feathered squid. Working in pairs, the men swing the struggling fish over the side to the deck. A brilliant sunset marks the passing of the storm and the calming of the sea. It has been a strenuous day, but a good start has been made toward the 375 tons of tuna the crew and captain hope to take home. Next morning, the smooth sea makes it possible to take advantage of the latest method in scouting for tuna. In the plane, the pilot flies over the calm blue ocean and gives special attention to dark patches on the water and to other signs which may indicate the presence of a school of tuna. By shortwave radio, the pilot reports to the captain on the clipper, school sighted 25 miles to southeast, I'm coming in. As soon as the plane returns and is put on board, the ship heads at full speed to the location of the school. Some of these men had grandparents who sailed out of the ports of Norway, Italy, Spain, Japan, and Portugal. Others that fished the coastline of Alaska, or men the trawlers that sail from the ports of New England. As we watch these fishermen in action, we see the coordinated efforts of a well-trained team. Fish of a school are usually uniform in size. And when in a school of smaller tuna, each fisherman handles a single pole. A third line is snapped onto the swivel to the three men working in unison will pull the giant fish from the water. The summer is busy throwing overboard the live and servettas that were gathered at Guaymas. The dancing squid bites in the water, and the hungry tuna, unable to distinguish between the squid and the bait, sooner or later swallows the hook. The Ancivetas seek protection from the tuna and try to hide under or near the ship. This keeps the school near the fishing rack and makes it possible to continue fishing for hours at a time. Every minute is valuable and all weak motion is eliminated. A marvelous type of hook is used so when the fish strikes the deck, the line can be slackened and the hook slips free. This 
entire period. The captain, Ernie Rose, is responsible for directing the work of the summer and the fishermen and keeping the ship in the best position for fishing. Only a man who knows the abilities of his men and the tricks of tuna fishing can successfully direct this exciting and hazardous work. After the fishing of each school has ceased, there is still much work to be done. The catch is transferred to the storage wells, where refrigerated brine is circulated to quick freeze the tuna. On all trips, many schools of tuna must be fished before the last storage wells are full. When a full load has been secured, the captain turns the prow of his ship northward and sends a message to Westgate that the clipper is homeward bound. When the ship has arrived safely in port, the fishermen once again don their work clothes and rubber boots. And they now have the heavy task of removing the tuna from the refrigerated hold. The old fish buckets are lowered into the holes and lift the tuna to the deck of the ship. Each bucket of tuna is closely examined by California state fish inspectors who permit only quality tuna to reach the cannery. After passing this preliminary inspection, the bucket swings to the plume tower where it is tipped, and the tuna splash into the fast-flowing water of the trough, which carry the fish to the cannery several hundred yards distant. When the tuna reach the outside of the cannery, they are lifted by these conveyor belts to the weigh tower. As the fish tumble into the weighing bin, the weight master and a member of the ship's crew watch the operation and check all weights and figures. Owners of the ship and members of the crew are paid on the basis of the weight of the catch as well as the variety of tuna. Great care is exercised to obtain accurate records of the catch. When each lot has been weighed and recorded, the tuna are released to make their final swim into the cannery where they're placed on the conveyor belt. The fish are first cut open for cleaning and the valuable livers are removed. Tuna livers are important in the manufacture of many kinds of drug and chemical products. Each fish is examined by an inspector and those that do not meet government standards are discarded and made into meal and other byproducts. After cleaning and washing, the tuna are placed in wire trays. When all the trays on the rack are filled, the tuna are wheeled away and prepared for cooking. When the fish have been thoroughly prepared, the racks are placed in these large steam pressure cookers. Exact control of the cooking time and temperature determines the fine flavor and texture of the tuna meat. The tuna remain in the cooker for a period of from three to eight hours, depending upon the size of the fish. After the required number of hours have elapsed, the whole cooked tuna is removed for cooling and the final packing process. The Westgate California Tuna Packing Company plant in San Diego is one of the largest fish canneries in the world. Its hundreds of cheerful workers enjoy bright surroundings and the advantage of all the latest and safest machines. This new plant is a model of cleanliness where a happy atmosphere lightens the task of the hundreds of busy workers. Inspectors and foremen are constantly moving about among the workers to see that all regulations are observed and to offer friendly advice wherever needed. In this large and cheerful room, skilled women remove the heads, fins, and skin from the cooked tuna. In the next step, the bones are eliminated and the dark meat is discarded. The undesirable parts of the fish are conveyed to the rendering plant, where they are converted into valuable byproducts. The skillful hands of these women soon remove all the unwanted parts of the tuna. All that remains is a fine-flavored choice fillet. This is the tuna meat that reaches the housewife.
Women place the fish on a trough where an endless belt feeds the tuna into an automatic machine which trims pieces to the correct size and weight and places them into the can. Just watch it work. The packed cans now move along the conveyor belt to the machine which adds the required amount of salt. Further along this line, a carefully blended salad oil is added. This helps to improve the flavor and maintain the delicate texture of the fish. Near the end of the conveyor belt, the high-speed sealing machine automatically double crimps each lid in place. As it seals the cans, it also stamps on each lid the government serial number, indicating the grade of the content and the packing date. Meantime, this busy counter keeps an accurate record of the pack. When the sealed cans leave the machine, they travel to the final sterilizing resource. To ensure that each pack has its proper stamping and code numbers, a government inspector is constantly checking. This coding makes it possible to trace the history of the contents from ship to shore. The cans are now subjected to a minimum heat of 240 degrees for a period long enough to thoroughly sterilize them. This intense heat also causes the salt and oil to penetrate the tuna meat. The operator in the control room keeps an accurate record on the time and temperature of each batch placed in the resource. This gauge records the facts required by the California State Board of Health. Only tuna packs that are duly certified from these charts can be placed on the market. When this sterilization has been completed, the steel baskets containing hundreds of cans are taken out and wheeled into the cooling room. Once again, the shiny cans resume their journey by hopper and conveyor belt. They ascend to the top of an inclined track that rolls them pell-mell to the busy labeling machine. As each can rolls through this machine, a label is neatly sealed to its side at a speed impossible for the human eye to follow. At this point, another ingenious machine arranges the cans in rows so that the man who operates the caser is able to fill the cartons with one simple operation. The filled shipping cases are then conveyed to another machine which seals each carton. When the cases of tuna are ready for shipment, they move along on endless belts to the railway freight cars waiting on the nearby siding where expert stackers stow the cases into the box cars. They follow a definite system of checking in order to avoid damage during shipment. When the box car has been loaded with hundreds of neat cases, the Westgate shipping foreman and the railway checker close and seal the door. The loaded freight cars are added to a train and soon leave San Diego. The breast of chicken tuna is on its way to the markets and homes throughout the length and breadth of America. Let's visit a typical American home in a small city. Here we find Mrs. Carter just finishing a nourishing tuna casserole for the evening meal. Two hungry school children are ready for a quick snack, which will give them added energy for a healthful period of play between now and dinner time. Mother knows that tuna is not only a highly digestible, high-protein health food, but also that her children like these tasty mid-afternoon sandwiches. It's easy to prepare a hot casserole with tuna meat as the principal ingredient, and Mrs. Carter knows that every ounce she buys will provide healthful and economical nourishment. 
long bridge of distance between Mrs. Carter's kitchen and the Bay of Guaymas is spanned in an instant by the magic of photography. Here we find the fishing boats and pelicans as active as ever. The bridge of memory continues southward to the fishing banks off the coast of Panama, where the tuna fishermen are continuously harvesting the riches of the sea. Back in San Diego, Pedro is preparing tuna for the cookers. Marie, Josephine, and many others are cleaning the fish, ready for the canning process. While Martha feeds the tuna into the automatic packing machine. Jonesy watches the dials that control the pressure retort. While Bill helps to load more freight cars with cases of dressed for chicken tuna. And in these modern offices, administrative, sales, and clerical staff oversee the many details necessary to the management of this far-flung enterprise. All of these men and women are members of an all-American team. They wrote Tuna Stories. <laughs>